Another $35 worth of entry-level mining questions answered for free. Conversations about mining. Hi, Jess. How are you? Yeah, I'm great, Andrew. How are you going? Yeah, really good. Thanks. Um, so we've got a, another group of questions that you, you've got um, sent in. So if you want Jess to ask you a question, um, just send it in and we'll run it through and we'll answer all yep. the questions that we can get. Um, but first, you've got yep. a shout out. I do have a shout out for Ricky. Um, he was one of our three-step plan package customers. Um, he was working as a driller's offsider. He completed the package, did the course, we did his resume, and he got a job as a nipper, and he's stoked because that's exactly the job that he was after. So congratulations, Ricky. Um, hope you're enjoying any job. Yep. Well done, Ricky. Well done. All right. Yep. So, um, yeah, so the, one of the reasons that we're doing these videos is because people are trying to sell information on the internet and around the place um, for around that $30 mark. And a lot of the information is wrong or supplied by people that just don't know themselves. So these are some of the questions that we get asked for people to confirm whether it's actually true or not for what they've been told in some of these questions and some of these um, things that you can buy. So, all right. So fire away, Jess. Okay, so my first question is, is why do so many entry level people fail? I, I you know, I, I hear this all the time. And then other people have told me that, you know, no, it's easy, just get a foot in the door any way you can. And you know, you'll be off and that'll be the start of this great career. But then on the flip side, I hear all these people that do get into these entry level roles. And they're failing They're they're, you know, they're quitting or they're not, you know, they're not making the cut. So why does that happen? Okay, so it it happens for a number of different reasons, but the probably the most straightforward and easiest way to answer it is that people just don't know what they're getting themselves into. A lot of people jump into the industry with a romanticized view about what mining is. They think that they're going to earn a lot of money. They're going to be part of this wonderful team that's going to be just like a big family and everything's going to be roses. When the reality of the situation sometimes can be very, very different. And um, one of the reasons why we wrote the training that we wrote back in the day as shift bosses is we just got sick of watching people fail because they weren't prepared properly. And it's not anybody's fault because the way the system's set up, the only way to learn how the mine works is to get a job apart from our training. Ours is the only non-company training that you can do in the country that teaches you how it all works. But not knowing how it all works and then jumping in and then expecting it all to go, it, you just leave yourself open to um, failing. And the easiest way to describe it is out of 100 people that go in for one of these um, nipper jobs or truck jobs or underground diamond driller jobs, you'll get five to 10 that are just ducks to water and they just get it straight away. Bang, they get it. And then you'll get another 30 people that will actually make a friend and that friend will spend a fair bit of time with them and go out of their way completely to make sure that they're doing the right thing. And then the other 60 people that are left, they just fail. It's just, it just is what it is. So if yeah. you don't know how it all works going in, then you leave yourself exposed to that. I often tell people, the longer it takes you to find your feet, the more chances that things can go sideways on you. And I've told this story before, but tag boards are a perfect example of that. I was working on a mine site where they had a bunch of new starters come up and um, they were on their second day or third day underground and they pulled up to the tag board and one of the charge up guys jumped out of the ute and grabbed everybody's tag and moved it from one side to the other, which is highly illegal and instant dismissal if you get caught doing it. One of the one of the new nippers tried to jump out and say, I'll grab my own tag. He was like, leave it. There was a jumbo operator and somebody else. This was on our cross shift. So we walked all into all this. This happened at knockoff. So we got a great big bollocksing about it in the morning meeting when we went into night shift. Yeah. But guess who pulled up directly behind the people that were doing the wrong thing? The underground manager and the resident manager. And they watched the whole thing go down. Now, there were seven guys in the ute. Um, three of them were brand new. They all lost their jobs on the spot. Everybody else, it was instant dismissal. But for everybody else in the ute, everybody knew what was going on. And before they got to the surface, they actually resigned. And they, you don't have to wow. fire me. I've resigned. I've quit. I know I've done the wrong yeah. thing. See you later. All those guys had jobs the next day. So they walked straight into another job and it's just the way that works. The new starters, the three new starters, that was it. That's it. It's all over and done with. You're never going to get another job again. And that's just not knowing what's going on around you and just being exposed to what goes on. And, you know, I'm sure people will be able to, in the comments below, tell lots of stories of, that they've heard and seen happen around the place. But if you don't know what the rules are, you're totally relying on somebody to make sure that they're doing the right thing by you. And the easiest way to avoid that is to learn the rules for yourself. 
And that's one of the reasons why we wrote the training is that we just got sick of watching people fail because they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. And the other good thing is that um, if you do know exactly what you're getting yourself into, then it lets you make a real decision on whether you actually want to go mining or not. We get a lot of people that do the training that decide that mining's not for them. And if you do and, you know, you spend $495 on the DIY and you decide it's not for you, then you've got out of it really, really cheaply um, because a lot of people spend a fortune – getting a job, quitting the job that they've got, getting up there, working out it's not for them, having to go back to wherever they came from, try and get another job, all that sort of stuff. And you're just burning cash the whole time. Um, I saw a comment on a Facebook post. I think you probably saw it as well not too long ago with the guy that reckoned yeah. he, he burnt 15 you know, grand just doing that. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't not believe him. You know, it's quite possible for that to happen. Yeah. So yeah, m yeah, much easier to work out whether you actually want to do it or not before you get there and try to do everything you can to ensure that you're not going to be blindsided by anything because that's how you end up failing. Like a lot of people fail and it's not their fault. Um, it's just circumstance because they didn't know and they got thrown in the deep end and the person that was supposed to be showing them didn't know themselves or for whatever reason. And because there's so much failure, you can tell your story as much as you want on the way out the door. And nobody's going to listen to you. It's just is what it is. Yeah. I don't agree with it. Hundred yeah. percent, don't agree with it. But it's it it is what it is, and you know it's like you know yeah. trying to yeah fight to fight nature. Um, yeah, yeah. I think it too. If you have that education and you know, you know, you know what you're walking into on the job side of things. The other side of things, like the personal, the the accommodation, the you know being away from your family, feeling a bit isolated, maybe it makes that a lot easier if you know what to expect in the job and you've got that covered and you're feeling confident in that. I think it just makes the whole process a lot easier than kind of feeling like you're, you know, failing on both sides, especially if you do struggle being away from home. Some people don't, but some people it can be a really big thing if you're struggling in a job and maybe feel like no one's helping you and then you're also struggling being away from home. I think if you've got that education, you know what you're doing and you feel like you've got work all covered, at least that's one part of it that's going to be a lot easier than, than it would be if you didn't know anything. Yeah, and we go into the culture side of it as well. We actually tell you what happens with the carton system. So when you get on get on the plane for the first time, probably not on the plane, probably once you jump on the plane onto the bus um, to go back to camp for the first time with your crew, you'll ju you jump on and somebody will yell out carton at you. And the reason they're yelling out carton at you is because it started as carton because you're getting your first, you know, your first job. And I can tell you here and now, the person that yells out cartons, probably the dickhead of the crew that doesn't pay their cartons, because that's normally the way <laughs> that one rolls. All right. Now, what we teach you in the training is a perfectly acceptable comment back to that person is that I will pay my starters carton once I find out what crew I'm going on to and I get my first paycheck. And that's perfectly acceptable. And if you say something like that straight away, ears will prick up on the back of the bus because you know what the carton system is. So maybe you've got some experience and you might know a little bit about what's going on. Um, yeah, because the other thing that happens too that I've watched happen a lot is that people pay their carton to the first crew that they get shoved on, which isn't normally yeah. the crew that they stay with. So they pay that carton and then they get moved on to their permanent crew. And because they think they've already paid a carton, they don't have to pay another one. They don't pay their second carton to their full-time crew. And within six weeks, they're gone. And you drive them out to the airport and they all say the same thing. Oh, the first bunch of guys that I was with, they were a really good crew, but that second crew was a bunch of bloody assholes. And all it was yeah. down to was the fact that you didn't put your starters carton on. And if you put yeah. your starters carton on, you would have, you know, completely. And yeah, I agree. Yeah, you shouldn't have to double up, but that's knowing the system. And if you'd done yeah. the training, you wouldn't have doubled up because you would have waited until you got on your permanent crew before you put your starters carton on, which is perfectly acceptable. Yeah. And that's just yeah. knowing what you're getting yourself into. I think that's a good example. Yeah, it is. Definitely. Cool. Okay. The next question is what is involved in a medical? What are they looking for? What do I expect? Okay, so medicals can go in varying degrees depending on who you're working for. So if you're going for a BHP or a Goldfields or a Northern Star or a Rio or one of the big mobs, you'll probably have to do your standard medical that everybody does. And then you'll have to do this functionality thing that they get you to go and do. And that costs, you know, last time I did one, it was about $1,700. I'm sure they're probably about two and a half grand now. And the whole idea is that they getting all your functionality. So it's 
not a, a win fail type thing. It's they're getting a baseline for you. So if you hurt yourself, they can say, all right, when we got you, you were here and now you've fallen to here. So we owe you this much money. So that can be one of the medicals you go for as well as your standard medical. In your standard medical or a minor's health surveillance, which is what you do over here in WA if you're going for a minor's job or in one of the other states, it's very similar now. Um, they're doing lung function. They're doing range of mobility. They're doing um, eyesight and hearing, all the basic stuff just to try and work out that you're in one piece. Um, and the reason that they're doing this is because over the journey that I've watched them being ripped off several times. Like, you know, I've got a fair few stories about people that have shown up to the site and two days later, oh, I've blown my knee out. Or I got one guy in Norseman. He was there. He did the induction in the morning. He was just supposed to fill in on the ROM um, for uh, a little while. He jumped into the seat of the um, loader on the ROM, jumped back down again on my back, on my back. It cost him half a million dollars. Um, that's wow. why you're doing medicals, um, is to make sure that you're not carrying anything into in with you. Um, don't treat the medical like they're your GP. Um, the medical doctors often, they've got no personality. That's why they're doing it. And the more people they see in the day, the more money they make. So the last thing they want to be doing is talking to you for half an hour when it should only be 10 minutes. And the other thing I like to tell people is that they're treating you like cattle. So you should act like a bit of cattle. Um, you know, yes, no, yes, no, lift, cough, turn your head, bang, 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 in and out. And once you've been in the industry for a while, you have to do these bloody things all the time. If you go for five different jobs and you get offered five different jobs, you'll have to do five different medicals. So just be aware of that. Um, they are, you know, time consuming pain in the ass, but it's part of the industry. And the reason that they're doing it is because they've been stung a lot of money in the past. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, like Andrew said, they will each company and each site. A lot of the time, they'll be very different. You could go into one; it could be twenty minutes, half an hour. You go in, you do your drug and alcohol, you do a basic fitness test, have a bit of a chat to a nurse, and you're at the door. Others, it will be really involved. Like you, it may take up. To, we would usually say, kind of allocate half a day because sometimes you can be doing a really intensive, <laughs> a lot of testing and blood testing and, yeah, all sorts of panel work and doctors and nurses and physios that can be pretty involved. So just always block out quite a good chunk of time. Um, make sure you're walking fit. Don't overshare, like Andrew said. Don't, yeah, they're not your doctor. They're not going there to see if you're okay and if you need help with X, Y, Z. Just answer what they ask you and get through it, like, yeah, don't. <laughs> yeah. And, and don't. drug tests, it's really important with drug tests that you declare anything that you've had for basically yeah. two months because it all, it shows up and everything's got a marker on it now. So if you had, um, like for whatever reason, you had a toothache six weeks ago and you took some stronger medication that wasn't prescribed to you, but somebody gave you, still put it down. Because like the chances are it'll show up and if it shows up, you've got this stuff in your system that you haven't declared. It only becomes a problem if you don't declare it. And we've had a few people um, get on the wrong side of a medical lately because they haven't declared stuff. And that's been unfortunate. I, myself, a couple of years ago, consulting in the city for a recruitment company, I had to do a medical to go to site and I didn't even think about um, declaring sleep medication. I just didn't even think about it. I don't know why. And I failed my medical. And luckily that my, like the guy who I was dealing with, the client was really cool and had known me for a long time. And I had a script obviously for it, um, but that could have ended badly. If I was flying to site or it was a mining company, they could easily have just cancelled my contract and said too hard basket, don't care why, nah, you're next. <laughs> yep. yep. And that's what that's normally what happens, unfortunately. Yeah. They're, because they've is. got people lined up around the corner and everybody's trying to clamor into these jobs, they can just go next and they've got a hundred people waiting in the wings. Um, so you yeah. need to be a bit active. Then the whole thing flips on its head. Once you get over that 12 months experience mark at the moment, then the ball definitely goes back into your court. And if you end up with five yeah. or ten years experience, then yeah, you can pretty much name your price at the moment for a lot of jobs that yeah. are going around. Um, especially in the gold and copper mines. Yeah, definitely. Um, so my next question is, what are they looking for on a police clearance and how do they work? Okay, so 
up until 2007, all you had to do was get a police clearance from the state that you were located in. And even if you had stuff expunged off your record after the five years, you know, the good old five years that would go away, which is the rule that I think that should be and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then we had the terrorism bombings in Bali in 2003. In 2007, they changed um, the terrorism laws. And because all the mine sites use AMFO, which is basically what they use to blow up the Sari Club, um, and it's yeah. ex 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 um, looked as extremely dangerous, and everybody on a mine site's got access to it. They made everybody do these ASIO police clearances. And I remember getting them, and we be being told that, no, just sign it. It's just a standard police clearance. It's not going to mean anything. They just want a new hoop for you to jump through. But turns out it's not a new hoop. Turns out it's something that breaks everything open. So if you've got stuff that's been taken off your record for five years, all that stuff comes up. If you've got stuff that's been sealed, all that stuff comes up everything comes up and it's not just if you've got a criminal record if they deem that you've got family members that aren't doing the right thing you can be asked to leave and in the case where i was we had three people on site they got they got a um, management got a letter back saying we prefer um if you didn't hire these guys and if these guys weren't um weren't going so it's um yeah it, it just it, it is what it is um one of the guys didn't have a criminal record he didn't even know that his um sister was married to a bikey he didn't know that he was a bikey <laughs> um but because he was they deem the um it too close contact and yeah no we don't want him working around explosives and they're allowed to do yeah. it they, you, you don't have a leg to stand on under the new laws um it sucks yeah. and i don't agree with it um so hard and fast the rules and it's different you know like it's up to the resident manager obviously and you've got to pass that asio clearance but normal hard and fast rules are if it's violence or if it's stealing you, you're not you're wasting your time if you've been done for drugs or um you know doing something like that if they that's normally not a problem because they get to drug test you every day same thing with the driver's license we often get asked a lot about i've lost my driver's license because i blew over um if you just blew over or you just lost your license because you've got a few um demerit points that's not going to be an issue if you were bloody driving down the mitchell freeway with 10 cop cars chasing you down the road and all that sort of stuff then yeah that's going to be an issue so it's all you know not not common sense but you know it's all all about the scale of it all but definitely if you've um grievous bodily harm or violence or any stealing stuff that's you know unfortunately you can rule a line underneath it they won't take you yeah cool awesome uh another question i have is i've been looking at all the mining um you know sites and pages on facebook and there's lots of talk about mrl and they're closing sites and should i you know should i not be looking at them and what's happening you know there's no jobs anywhere everyone's kind of freaking out a bit what's the deal with that <clears throat> okay so um one of the reasons mrl is shutting their lithium site is that they've the lithium price has just taken a bath it's down significantly on um its all-time highs and they initially tried to restructure the site by going from even time rosters to two and one. And they've done that for about three months. And obviously that's not going to work either. So they're just putting it straight into care and maintenance. And a lot of these people that have got, um, that are losing their jobs on that site, they'll be able to walk into jobs on gold sites or copper sites elsewhere. Um, there's going to be a few people that are going to get left high and dry, but the majority of people are going to be able to take those skills and transfer them straight into gold mines and copper mines around the country, which are screaming for people. Um, so yeah. it's like when Nickel West shut. Nickel West shut, um, yeah, end, beginning of this month, you would have thought that that would have stopped, you know, would have um, flooded the market with all these people that need jobs and all that sort of stuff. Turns out not so much. Turns out all the employers are still having to hire new starters for their nippers and truck and offsiders. Um, even Adji and Paceville, they're having to take new starters for because because they just need bums yeah. in seats. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and I guess if you were giving advice, what and you know, yes, what would be the number one thing that I would do to get a job, an entry level role right now? What would be the number one thing that I could do to get myself an entry level job right now? Um, if you've got a manual car license, educate yourself, learn how their mind works. Nothing goes over better with the employers than being able to walk in and actually use the right terms and talk about how it all works. Because that's where the ironic thing is for the last sort of 
10 years I've been involved in this, there've always been jobs on the actual mine site. They've always been looking for nippers and trucks and all that sort of stuff, but there's been easier jobs to get in shutdown work and utility work and all that sort of stuff because the industry has been running hot and everybody's needed people. Now that only gold and copper are running hot and everything's gone, everything else has gone stone cold, it's sort of flipped on its head. And the ironic thing is that where they need people and where they have to hire new starters is the actual mining jobs where they don't need people and they've got an oversupply of people is in shutdown and utility and all that sort of stuff. Um, One of the jobs that I looked at in the job hunt video yesterday, one of the utility jobs had gone back down to 75,000 a year. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at them and they were 85,000 a year, but somebody's got a job out in there for two and one 75,000 a year. And the only reason you're putting that ad in is because you can. And, you know, you, yeah. people have to, you know, have a job and pay the mortgage and they'll just take what they've got to take because there's an oversupply. Um, it's not, I don't agree with it, It's, but it is what it is. And that's mining. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Excellent. Any more questions? That's it. Excellent. So if you've got a question that you'd like Jess to ask, we're going to keep doing these regularly weekly. Um, Please send them through because I know a lot of people are a bit fearful about asking questions because they think that they're going to look stupid or they get some terrible comments on some of the um, the posts as well. There's some real dickheads out there that don't know anything about mining. So we thought that we'd make this a bit of a safe space by, you know, forward your questions on and Jess is more than happy to ask them and I'll answer them and we'll work our way through them. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you. No worries. So if you, um, yeah, like I said, if you've got any questions, send them through. If you can share the video around and like and subscribe the channel. Thanks. Thanks.